this right Chasing stars and holding you I can't see the end, but we'll see it through All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, glad to have you join us this tonight. Um, so uh, it's a little early for me, so I don't know if y'all can see, but it's actually light out now, you know. Um, so with everybody's time change now, uh, I get to join at six o'clock in the evening instead of seven. So, uh, you know, being the, the one of the few actually uh, Rob's pseudo West Coast, he's, he's kind of mid country, but yeah. Uh, West I Coast for me. The, you're but, the only state that doesn't change for the time zone, isn't it? Everyone else uh, changes. I think there's one other one, but you know we're we're normal here, unlike the rest of y'all. So, uh, <laughs> so I do have a, a couple articles tonight, but uh, uh, just to you know identify, I think our names are all here, but we got Dave, uh, Alex, and Dan, and Rob with us tonight. So uh, I got quite a few articles to cover uh, across a varying. Uh, degree of topics, but uh, let me get my screen shared here. Uh, first and foremost is going to be remote ID. Um, the uh, um, discretionary enforcement uh, is now over. Um, and as of Saturday, um, everybody is required to have remote ID now. Um, so it's it's so terrible that the, the remote ID rules are so complicated that whenever you see like this picture here where it's got try a little caption trying to sum up what remote ID means, it's impossible <laughs> no to idea. do it in one sentence. And they, <laughs> right. they say nearly all drones weighing more than 55 pounds, which is correct. Mm -hmm. But like that, when people skim that, they're like, oh, if it weighs less than 55.55 pounds, I don't need remote ID. Well, in some cases yeah. you do. And in this case, you don't. And, in the, and if it's, it's recreational just, and you registered it. <sighs> yeah, it just, it just yeah. bothers me yeah. so much that the, the rules are that complicated that you can't sum it up easily at all. And then people yeah. try to, and then other people get confused even more. Yeah, just a pet. It's something we faced for a long time, <laughs> and even and the, the people who know the clear. rules get confused occasionally on what does this actually mean? Are we good here? Are we not good here? You know, stuff like that. It's always a good time. So, uh, drone pilots and manufacturers in the U.S. will now face fines or suspensions if their drones are not equipped with remote identification technology. Uh, as of Saturday, the FAA's remote ID rule, which mandates that all drones required to be registered with the agency include a digital license plate that broadcasts information such as ID number, location, and altitude, is in full effect. The rule is intended to allow the FAA, law enforcement, and other federal agencies to monitor unsafe flights as more drone pilots are in their wings. So I'm just going to you know, throw the age-old caveat of uh, if somebody plans to do something improper chances are they ain't going to be flying remote id so just going to throw that out there uh i know it's an argument that's been used in a lot of different uh segments of the population and and, and rule making but it's it's accurate um so uh with the rule now in effect businesses law enforcement agencies and even recreational flyers face the possibility of their drone pilot license being revoked or civil penalties up to $27,500 for flying a drone without remote ID. So, hey, that's super fun. Um, yeah, so uh, I know there's a myriad of remote ID modules out on the market now. And um, uh, I haven't heard of any major restrictions in getting them um, as of now. Um, so I guess, uh, if you want to continue flying and don't want to face a, a potential penalty of up to $27,500, um, well, that know. was the whole point of the delay, right? Is that they were now supposed to be widely available. Mm hmm And I mean, I think widely available probably doesn't really meet that standard, but they're, they're out there. Um, you can get them. Um, 
I know uh, um, several different manufacturers, including uh, uh, Flight Test with their Easy ID, um, uh, is uh, available through multiple outlets. We've got MRID that's available, right? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, Spectrum, Spectrum has one now, or no? Uh, is it Spectrum? Yeah, yeah. yeah Spectrum yeah. sort of has one. Sky, it's sort, <laughs> sort of, of sort of a remote ID. <laughs> So uh, prop, uh, props to uh, MRID. That's uh, mm-hmm. they're available on uh, uh, the company is Phoenix. So if you just search MRID uh, uh, UAS, and that'll uh, bring you to their page. And, or you can uh, ask uh, CB Runner in the comments. He'll direct you to the or CBR Runner. I always forget that extra R. <laughs> uh, he'll direct you where you can buy them. It's, yep, it's a Honda. <laughs> uh, it's, that's, yeah, that's what it is, and the. Um, um, and yeah, full disclosure, uh, I'm now the interim CEO of Flight Test, and uh, we we uh, designed and uh, sell the uh, FT Easy ID. And Dan has done a great piece of work on uh, a write up on uh, a number of uh, remote ID module broadcast modules that are mm-hmm. we feel are appropriate to small UAS. Uh, so they're reasonably priced, and uh, uh, the uh, the weight is uh, uh, reasonable. So we left off the uh, uh, the three hundred dollar uh, variety and the ones that were a couple of ounces as like really so uh, uh, good good listing good description and a good start of uh, a review of all of the the, the uh, ones that we feel are applicable and uh, if you're flying now without remote ID you are not alone by the FAA's own admission there is a very low compliance rate with remote ID. <laughs> <laughs> Do I right. still have that graphic? I can't remember. If yeah. So, so our our view is it's up to everyone's individual choice whether they they want to comply or not. Our recommendation mm-hmm. is, if you asked us, is yeah, you know, it's we're trying to make it uh, easier, uh, both um, better safe uh, than sorry. F, FPV FC is uh, still uh, getting free as wherever we can. So is uh, mm-hmm. FTCA. And I, I know uh, the AMA is busy at it. They have about a thousand of their twenty six hundred done, uh, and I'm not sure if the STEM plus C guys are processing free applications, but uh, we sure are at uh, FPVFC as well as uh, Flight Test uh, Community Association. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know STEM C has uh, several, at least here in the uh, er, uh, in Arizona. Um, Great, that they've uh, hit so. Um, and several of those include uh, the state mandated parks for drones. So that's, um, that's definitely a positive from their side too. So we thank them for that here in Arizona. So um, did, did you find our, that graphic from the FAA, Josh? No, I didn't. <laughs> I know it was posted in our Discord. It was from the last uh, advisory committee meeting. I think uh, yes. they had it. It was so it's yeah in, in those slides somewhere. Um, oh yeah, I don't know if we want to dig it out. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it's such bad data. The gist of so, it is the FAA is basically making up some numbers to show what they think compliance rates are, and then they're saying that they're very low and trying to get other people and CBOs mm-hmm. like us to try to help get enforcement up higher. Yeah, and they had recreational UAS down in the hundreds of thousands, low hundreds of thousands. Well, and they had an asterisk there basically saying that it was provided by the CBOs, but they didn't ask us. We didn't provide any information. No. So basically they're saying the AMA gave them some number about something, and they put it in the document. (laughs) Yeah, about as good as the numbers in the uh, free of PEA document. Here, I have it if you want me to share my screen. Yeah, please. Let me uh, turn mine off here for a second. There you go. And so for so, everybody who didn't know, this was presented during the Advanced Aviation Advisory Committee. Is that what AAAC still stands for? Yep. Uh, about sure a week ago? Was that last, so, last Wednesday? Yeah, last, last week. So it's the <laughs> FAA's FACA. And so you know, we should just say again and again, we feel these numbers are completely bogus. Um, I mean, they, you know, this was uh, written by and presented by an FAA person, but they didn't use their own uh, documentation. They, the FAA publishes an administrator's fact book on a um, somewhat periodic basis. They estimate uh, recreational small UAS at 1.8 million. Do we see 1.8 million anywhere, even a fraction of that on this page? No. Now I get it's registered in compliance, but they're not, they're, you know, this is, this is just junk and, 
to me, this is, it's important. And we've talked about how do we get a better set of numbers than this this garbage? Because when people, you know, when when Congress, when the FAA, when industry looks at numbers like this, it's like, well, is there a business opportunity? Well, is how big is my constituency? Well, mm -hmm. is this really important? Well, it is important because we're, you know, there is a material number of drones in the air today, and you know that's why we're we take this so seriously. So obviously, I get a bit incensed when I see the FAA put up garbage like this on a uh, uh, on a public meeting that they are representing this as fact. It's yeah. it, it's it's pathetic. Yeah. And the only numbers they really have are <laughs> what's been registered at the FAA drone zone, how many people have registered their drones, how many people have registered standard or remote ID drones, how many people have actually registered modules to go with their drones. Right. Everything Good. else is just imagined information. Right. And right. I also have a feeling too, when it comes to, uh, more than a feeling, but when it comes to the, the number of aircraft actually registered um, has significantly fallen off uh, from that first initial push, right? So when it first rolled out, I think a lot of people registered because, you know, it was five bucks. It was fine it was a couple years worth and and i think a lot of people just probably forgot to re-register or chose or not didn't to care. or right. didn't care yeah, it's not or, worth it, you know, worth it what, what did it matter time. right so um i think uh you know there's there's a lot of uh just missing data here and right. uh, we're, so we're if you so if you want if you that. want to comply with a remote id you do have, and you want to fly recreationally, you do have to register yourself. Then when you go on the drone zone, you'll be prompted to register your recreational aircraft. So, uh, that, in our view, is optional because you're flying recreationally and you don't have to register aircraft. Mm -hmm. And then if you're flying sub 250, as Kevin Morris has advised, absolutely do not register that aircraft because once you register it, then it has to have remote ID on it. So because the remote ID requirements map to registration. So as uh, Dan pointed out, it, the uh, the rules are uh, remain uh, convoluted, but uh, we're doing everything we can to uh, make it easy and simple to fly. And that's either, you know, first with Frias, and then secondly, make it frictionless with uh, thanks to uh, to Brian and Ken for MRID, as well as the FTEZ ID from Flight Test. And if you are going to fly recreationally with a module, then you're supposed to go to the drone zone and register the module. But I don't think you can just register a module. You have to like yeah, you can. Uh, attach it to a plane or a, a model. No, you aircraft. can register an individual module. I just did it. You, you uh, can a week now. Ago. Okay. Yes. Good. I thought before I you go to fly. And... I thought before you kind of had to attach it to a, a nope. an aircraft. So I just made up like home built aircraft and yeah, put I a could. module on it. <laughs> yeah, I can probably log into drone zone and show you guys. But yeah. yeah. So we, now there's just like you would have just no identifying aircraft, information. You can register a module individually. Good. And, yeah, I don't and, think it does. I'll double check first. But because All right, while it, you do that it's leg, it's legitimate to move a broadcast module if you're flying recreationally from aircraft to aircraft. It is and you can do that with part one oh seven but you have to unregister the module and then re-register it. And I think that's $5 for each transaction. You know, the yeah, unregistered, the register. for some amount of time. I don't remember if up we're until, still in the waiver. Up until December 2023. Last. Okay, so now you're into the point of paying for it every time you move it. Yep. All right, so I'm curious uh, <clears throat> on how accurate this article is, but uh, um, there, this uh, article, this is from Yahoo and Digital Camera World. Um, only one drone company is ready for FAA remote ID regs now in force. Um, so they're saying uh, the UAS based drone manufacturer Skydio, which last year Ooh. narrowed its customer base to strictly enterprise and commercial, is the only drone manufacturer which is fully ready for the enforcement of the FAA remote ID regs on drones in the US, according to a new study by SkySafe. Uh, no. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> Next closest is the world's most popular drone based or drone brand DJI, of course, has rather more products to contend with when it comes to its catalog. Despite the uphill task, SkySafe gave DJI three star three stars out of four, uh, with minor issues on March 13th. 
Uh, in general, DJI has moved to support remote ID installing Wi-Fi beacon-based remote ID, but some need firmware updates because of an inconsistency in the altitude reporting, uh, which is sometimes reported as the distance above uh, HAE, which is height above ellipsoid, and in other times MSL, which is mean sea level. The other quirk in DJI's range is that the DJI Mini 3 and the DJI Mini 4 Pro both, uh, which are under 250 grams, have stopped transmitting remote ID entirely by default, granted, because they're sub-250. However, uh, which is fine for recreational use, but means Part 107 pilots are non-compliant, though upgrading to DJI's heavier battery pushes the weight over the threshold. So this is funny, because I have a friend who I'm introducing into the hobby, and we were looking at the DJI Mini 4 Pro, and... He's like, well, I want the bigger batteries. And I'm like, then you have to broadcast remote ID. And he's like, I have to what? <laughs> he's like, and I'm like, and then you have to register. And he's like, I have to what? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. Who paid for this uh, study? Really? You know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, to, to Josh's point, I still, uh, and I, I'd ask that anyone watching this, if someone says, well, you know, I've, I've got a friend who's a new into recreational, what do I need to do to fly? That's on our, our homepage. That's mm -hmm. uh, because that's a question we get asked multiple times a week. Yeah. So uh, we got Parrot, only two out of four stars with uh, a stern needs improvement. Uh, many of the remote ID systems uh, were based on a legacy French standard, and 43% of the drones in use had non compliant remote ID identifiers. You know, if you look um, at this the other way around, this could be promoting which brand of drones you can still buy today. You can think about and it. be yeah, able to fly yeah. without remote ID because you bought it. Like, yeah, it doesn't work. They missed the production uh, requirements. Um, you still and have apparently to pair it. You can turn it off in the app. So hey, that's great. Right. 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 You Dan's still have to comply with the, the yeah. piloting requirements or operating requirements, but the manufacturer mm -hmm. requirements are on them, and if they're not. <laughs> meeting right. them but, oops but what's important here is this this is a good definition of what kevin morris described to us so i purchased a drone it does not have a uh, remote ID, standard remote id on it that's not my fault that's what the that's the manufacturer's issue if and then we know that a using a drone that's man that's produced mass produced has to have standard remote id however kevin would point out to us correctly that if you purchased it legit and it does not have remote ID, you should be able to use a module on that and operate it uh, with part 107, as long as it's uh, within visual line of sight rules. So no BV loss, no operations over people. So, <laughs> so. yet another little uh, tweak in the, uh, in the regs. Yeah. So well, here's another one. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. So, Dave, since you come from the fixed wing, fixed wing world a lot, does an RTF include a battery? Um, well, it's an eight. It's the all up weight. So the um, well, does it? Well, I get the main question is RTF. The, yeah. No. Does no is the question. RTFs don't include batteries. Correct. They do not. Okay. Because yeah. I thought that's I thought initially RTFs how included. initially how Horizon was saying. Well, there's no battery in it, so it's you know yeah. officially a DIY. Because I just. <laughs> bought a horizon plane and it said rtf and there was no battery right right so didn't have standard remote id either yes exactly <laughs> quizzical so and i'll tell this is this is cute so uh um the remote id fix uh fitted to autel drones has a fixed address across all devices and the beacons indicated an ssid of uh, default SSID. And, That's like what uh, you get with a, a router that you buy from Best Buy. Right. Yep. And then uh, some also indicate the altitude in the negative. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, then you're never flying more than 400 feet off the ground. <laughs> right. <laughs> You'd have to fly nice. to 800 to get to 400. That's awesome. Oh, my gosh. Oh. oh. Brian, so, uh, Brian of uh, MRID is is laughing uh, uh, uncontrollably like na right now because he <laughs> understands why they came up with a negative number. <laughs> <sighs> so, oh, hey, uh, you know, uh, there's that. So uh, uh, in the, we'll in the YouTube chat, uh, let's see, Bitsbytes is asking, how is Parrot compliant with part 89 if you can't, if you can just turn off remote ID? 
I'm no, guessing the answer is cannot. they're not compliant. No, right. they're not compliant. Yeah. That's what they're saying here. But that's, that's not the operator's <laughs> fault again. That's the producer's fault. So it's that's the manufacturer's right. problem. And if you bought mm -hmm. it and fly it, that's you have different rules. Right. <laughs> hey, Dave, have we brought it up? So if, if you buy a if you buy a almost ready to fly, let's say you solder the XT60 on there, do they consider you the producer or do they consider the producer or the, the like, like, where does the line, where does the line stop? Do we know? No, it remains if, it, if it's uh, manufactured elsewhere and, and you just uh, um, put the, put a battery in it, that's still uh, manufactured by someone else. If it's a, a DIY uh, or, you know, do it yourself or home built to use the FAA term, then it, you know, then you're assembling it and, uh, that has to be recreational only. That, but there's no, not he's he's no clear definition. Is. Right. So, there's not. And, it's intentionally yeah. vague. Right. Yeah. Mm. Another intentionally we'll vague have to wait definition. The FA goes after someone for that one. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. What's the precedent? No, mm. I don't want to volunteer to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> Alex always seems to be game for these, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you give me the money. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Uh, All so, right. So Bits so, Bytes is also have, saying that they're not saying have, that the pilot is liable, but buying a parrot drone, you might be at risk of that the DOC being rescinded by the FAA. So obviously, I, we assume that there is a declaration of compliance, right, from Parrot. They're selling these, but it's not compliant. So is the FAA going to rescind that? Are you going to take it back? I guess then exactly. again, you're still in that position where you bought a drone that's not compliant. That's not your fault. You just have to be careful of how you fly it. You need a remote ID module on it. Right. But you don't need standard remote ID. You don't have to have meet all the production requirements. Right. Because you didn't You're producing something essentially legacy and yeah. uh, and attaching something to it. And and that's the question, right? Do we if if Parrot has a DOC and um, the FAA went through and just said, yeah, you're great. You're good to go and uh, didn't do any in-depth analysis, then yeah, yeah. But, but, I mean, we have no the evidence question, they did that to any of them. Right. The, mm -hmm. the question is is legit. The, for certainly the FAA could uh, uh, revoke the, uh, the declaration of compliance. They have uh, the authority to do that at will without uh, data, apparently. Okay, U.S. lawmakers I, ask Biden administration. Before we go to that, I have the drone zone pulled up. If you guys want to see the perfect uh, during the module itself first, just so we keep on the same topic. Yeah, hundred percent. So especially so, if you bought a parrot drone that's not compliant, and you, you need your own remote ID module. This is how you would register one, right? Yeah. So when you're on the recreational flyer dashboard, you go to your inventory or managed devices. Yeah. Uh, and you add the device it asks you what blah 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 but then you can select your device type of standard or broadcast module yeah i just added a blah 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 or right. well but aren't you still this is still a model uh, well it's a mod it's, it's a module it's a device it's that's a, individual yeah. from your aircraft it looks like that's cool this is a this is a, I don't a, this think is it was plus. like that before, but maybe I'm not I agree. This right. is yeah, this is not what I saw. Yeah. This is good. I this have is two new. of the same module registered. Sweet. <laughs> now you're really gonna <laughs> Wait, throw off their Am numbers. I allowed to do that? Register the same module twice. Well, you just did, so there you yeah. go. File a bug <laughs> report with the FAA drone zone. <laughs> yeah. I have two module two of the same modules registered. <clears throat> With the same ID, broadcast ID information, I assume. Yep. Yes. Well, that that's what it was. It, I used the same broadcast module ID number. Well, it's a good thing it's not it's under part one hundred and seven, right. so you don't have to pay five dollars each time. Exactly. Does that mean there I'm double compliant? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm making up for those who don't register. There you go. There you go. You're boosting the FAA's numbers. Wait, All right, so can I actually do that by just going to re register no. every single no. out there? If you put in a few thousand of them, it would make a significant well, dent in the, the percentage. Serial numbers are published. No, oh, I could just goodness. register all the modules to myself. Oh goodness me! Yeah, yeah, but there, then there when are somebody a lot of does flaws. something wrong, yeah, when somebody I does something wrong, guess whose door they're knocking on? But I have an excuse. You have an excuse, but you have to deal with the headache in, in between. 
<laughs> All right. So a bipartisan group of U.S. lawmakers on Wednesday asked the Biden administration to impose higher tariffs on Chinese drones, including those shipped from other countries, and new incentives to boost U.S. drone manufacturers. Um, so Representative Mike Gallagher, chair of the House China Committee, and the panel's top Democrat, Raja not even going to pretend to pronounce that. And 11 other lawmakers urged the administration to take immediate action against Chinese drone makers, including DJI and Autel. This included hiking tariffs to stop the mass proliferation of a technology in the U.S. market that poses a clear national and economic security threat. They said in a letter to the U.S. Trade Representative Commerce and Homeland Security Departments. Uh, the letter said the current 25% additional tariff on Chinese drones is insufficient to combat the surge in imports. Um, so, uh, hey, what does this mean? Well, this means that uh, if this goes through uh, and they impose a higher tariff, that means uh, if you do choose to go with the DJI drone uh, for whatever reason, uh, you're going to be paying more for it uh, because these tariffs pass the buck to the consumers. and. Right. And I mean, that's legit really what it does. So it's a disincentive to the consumer to, to buy product instead of, you know, whatever it is they want to do. So uh, the push on drones comes after several lawmakers have called on the Biden administration to hike tariffs on Chinese made vehicles. Uh, the Chinese drone companies hold over 77 percent of the U.S. hobby drone market and over 90 percent of the market for commercial drones, the lawmaker said. And I would say that's probably even higher if you take into account DIY uh, significantly, because uh, I would say close to, I don't know, Dave, what do you think? 90, 95% of all our stuff comes from uh, China? Oh, yeah. Easy. Yeah. Yes, but it's not uh, all DJI, but it all comes from there. Right. Yeah. Uh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, flight controllers, motors, ESCs. ESCs. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Very few out of Europe. Very few out of, other than China. So um, the letter noted Malaysia's drone exports to the United States, which were minimal as of recently as 2019, jumped to 2000 or sorry, 242,000 units in 2022. And in the first 11 months of 2023, topped 565,000. Uh, what's the significance of that? They're, they're pushing uh, a lot of this stuff through Malaysia instead of direct from the Chinese homeland uh, or mainland, I should say. Also uh, interesting as you keep those numbers in mind and think of the registered numbers. And I, I understand that the chart that we <laughs> showed earlier was registered and, and it's going mm -hmm. to be a lower number, but this gives you some sense of if these are annual numbers and you know, what's the longevity of a, of a drone. If Alex is not flying it, it's probably, <laughs> uh, you know, a couple of years. So <clears throat> oh, I try to keep the average. Sure that we That's right. Yeah, we, He's trying to keep it down a little bit. You yeah, know? Keep, yeah. keep that distribution. So, uh, yeah. So the letter also raised national security concerns about Chinese drones, saying they're, they risk putting U.S. persons' data in the hands of, of the PRC's military and intelligence services. DJI has repeatedly said its drones do not pose risk to American user data. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Basically, more costs pass on to you uh, because you decided to go with a certain manufacturer for a certain use case. What's uh, interesting is this: this is a committee on China, so this is not even the subcommittee, aviation subcommittee. So, ugh. And and here's the here's the thing that that I'm just gonna you know throw out there is that they want to elevate U.S. drone manufacturers. They want to stop. Uh, the imports of this on a national security uh, position, but then you have companies and, and, you know, they can do what they want. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to cast a little criticism. You got companies like Skydio who generally create probably the most advanced U S made drone that do not sell to consumers. They are enterprise and commercial only. So what's the, What's the alternative to something like a DJI for somebody who wants to do the things that a DJI can do? There's not a, a, an alternative. I mean, it doesn't exist. And that's the problem that we're having is people are going to continue to buy these because of the feature sets that they provide. And there's nothing comparable to replace them with that anybody is creating. So where, where I mean, where do you find the line, right? 
you know, FPV drones are great, but are they essentially photography drones in the essence of, of DJI? No, yeah. not, I, not I, by any stretch. I think we're going to have several years of a, a drought if things like if this, like this tariff are agreed to. And then we're, we're starting to see uh, signs of uh, U.S. made um, drone components. Whereas if you, if you were to take apart a Skydio today, uh, it's, it uses the uh, NVIDIA processor instead of an STM processor, which, and the NVIDIA processor is manufactured in Taiwan. It uses motors that are made in, in mainland uh, China. Uh, you know, the, the rest of it is mostly China. So it's, it's you know, U.S. California engineering, but the manufacturing and components are Chinese. So yeah, all, it, the batteries are stamped made in China as well. Yep. And, and here's the here's the flip side. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this up because this is kind of relevant to the discussion, right? So, Modal AI expands its suite of NDAA compliant drone components to advance UAS or advance US drone industry. So, here's a company that's producing components that are familiar to the FPV crowd. Um, and in fact, this one right here on the right is is uh, actually their FPV version. Um, of ESC, and they're releasing these. This is Modal AI, a blue UAS framework drone and autopilot manufacturer celebrated for its 16 gram autonomous UAS autopilot Voxel 2 announced availability of NDA compliant drone accessories. All right, so let's go to Modal AI's website. This is their Ouch. FPV ESC. Who's paying $300 for that? Because it ain't me. <laughs> it better like, have some really good features. And then hear, let's go to their Vox too. On NDA compliant stuff too. Does it have remote ID built in? You know, I don't know. I didn't go that far. So <laughs> here's their flight core. So this is their flight controller. Who's paying two hundred eighty nine dollars for a flight controller? So now you're up to six hundred ish dollars for the two pieces. Right. So and then yeah, you know, it just it doesn't make any sense to me. We've got if you want a perception module, which is their for autonomous drones. I don't even know. Let's see, three thousand dollars. There you go, three thousand dollars. So when you can get an entire high-end DJI drone for less than that, like blowing my mind here a little bit, right? So, and, and when Skydio did sell to consumers, what were their drones? Twelve, fifteen hundred dollars, and you can get like a full-scale Inspire for that, <laughs> Inspire Two for that. So, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me in any stretch of the imagination. And, and then you've got drones that DJI has, has created, like the, their agriculture drones. Nobody here is creating those. $20,000 gets you an agricultural drone that you can replace your, your um, uh, crop duster with. I mean, so fuel costs, all that stuff goes out the window. What you got here, Alex? Orca has uh, some NDA compliance stuff too. It's still expensive, but a little less than that. So ESC and FC. And they're out of Croatia, or did Croatia. they move? No, they're still there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Meat mentioned in the YouTube chat that I guarantee there's Chinese components in those NDAA compliant drones. <laughs> and oh, absolutely, one hundred percent. They're using <laughs> STM, STM, uh, right. uh, without a doubt, product. So. And they, they, they straight up call that. So if I go back to this flight core, I mean, they're using STM products, H7 chip. If I flip this over. If someone is really worried that Chinese chips or something are sending data back to China, then wouldn't they Chinese still be chips. doing it in these control flight <laughs> controllers? <laughs> so I, I'm just throwing that out there. It just, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So let's... And, and this is the thing that our government does is that we, we put the cart before the horse consistently. Okay. okay. Let's find got, a viable product. And got any happier forward. news? Uh, well, I mean, I have this. <laughs> so if you want to buy a radio jammer, <laughs> some drones for good, or, you know, we, someone rescued a, a dog. I do have, I have, I, I do have two. Yes. So good. number one, we touched on this a little bit later or a little bit earlier. So Fukushima, they got their drones into the reactor. We've got some images here. Let me see. Let me get my window back up. All right. 
So this is one of the pictures that they took. Uh, they took a series, I, I believe, of 10 pictures. There's only a couple here, but uh, this is inside the reactor. Uh, they're calling it the, uh, the area, un I think, underneath the reactor. It's called the pedestal under the core. Um, and I'm assuming a lot of this is just slag uh, from the meltdown. And if you're not familiar uh, of, of what radiation does to cameras, both digital and, and analog, the, the pixelation here is because of the amount of radiation uh, that's being thrown off. So um, they also had this uh, little snake drone, uh, a snake robot, I guess, that, that is aiding the flying drone a little bit to help guide it um, to get in there. So a little bit clearer of a picture, but uh, yeah, it's... Uh, De if you definitely a drone for good You, I mean, the fact that they, no one has to suit up and go in there is such a plus. A hundred percent. And here's the thing is, is this is supposed to help them aid in the potential cleanup and reclamation of this, you know, yep. years down the road, obviously, but yep. you know, to be able to map what's going on inside of there is, is epic. So, um, let's see. And then I also have this, the drone racing league and the United States air force is, uh, announcing a groundbreaking initiative to elevate women in sports and technology. So, uh, this was a topic of the AAC, right, Dave? The uh, um, elevating. I saw. Uh, I saw. I, I, I was. I, I did not sit in. Did not read the uh, the article. But yes, I, I I scanned it and saw that this was part of the AAAC. I apologize that I can't be no, more you're fine. Uh, in depth. <laughs> So uh, the Drone Racing League, uh, world premier professional drone racing property, uh, today unveiled DRL's Women's Taking Flight, a historic program to elevate women in sports, technology, and aviation. Uh, DRL's longstanding partner, the U.S. Air Force, signed on as a founding partner of the initiative, which will launch drone racing competitions, esports tournaments, and STEM curriculum to recruit the best women drone pilots to fly in DRL and the U.S. Air Force, and encourage all women to rise in traditionally male-dominated spaces. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, we're still at like about 97%, um, and that's what the airlines are in uh, the, on the flight deck. So pilot, co-pilot, 97% male. So anything any of us can do to uh, welcome uh, and make it a safe environment for girls <laughs> and women is a good thing, and we should do it. So uh, they say uh, the Drone Racing League is a fierce champion of diversity and inclusion. And we are excited to partner with the U.S. Air Force to further level the playing field in sports and technology. Our DRL Women Taking Flight, uh, Taking Flight platform will inspire women and girls to pursue their dream careers as drone pilots, athletes, and engineers while helping them develop their skills so they can compete on the highest stages, uh, said DRL President Rachel Jacobson. Um, so they're going to be hosting eSports tournaments on the DRL Sim um in which the winning pilot will be named a drl pilot um participating in drl races supporting drl's upcoming girls taking flight stem course to encourage girls to aim high and pursue tech sports and aviation careers so um good on drone racing league uh taking this on um Absolutely. so that's a happy that's there. a happy story i like that <laughs> so much cheerier than remote id <laughs> I'm sorry to be a Debbie Downer today. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then uh, last but not least, uh, we've got anti-drone companies uh, market radio jammer devices online, despite the FCC rules outlawing them. So now uh, this was a, a topic I think I brought up. Uh, last week in our internal meeting, but uh, there, there's become a proliferation of this kind of stuff. Um, so several online retailers and drone technology companies are marketing the sale of radio frequency jammers as drone deterrents or privacy tools, sidestepping federal laws that prohibit such devices from being offered for sale in the United States. Um, so re radio frequency jammers are devices that interfere with communication systems usually by sending out competing radio signals to confuse nearby electronics. So um, this comes from NBC News, I believe, and uh, they found that uh, several of these were on sale at Amazon, uh, at which point uh, after uh, 
contacting them, they were taken down, um, as obviously they should have been, but they also have also been popping up on eBay and other ones. So I'm going to spend a ton of time on this, but just know that utilizing devices such as this is not just about taking drones out of the air, uh, which is highly illegal. Um, it's also but... our 5.8 uh, gigahertz operates adjacently to uh, emergency vehicles Correct. and navigation frequencies. So you know, mm-hmm. as uh, Greg Revendu would say, don't be that guy. Yeah. Something so. related to this was uh, in a lot of the local news stations a few weeks back because people's houses were being robbed and they'd go to their security footage and they'd say, oh, their cameras weren't working because the people that robbed their house brought a Wi-Fi jammer and their, all their security cameras were using Wi-Fi so they didn't record yeah. any footage, which... Anybody who deals with any Wi-Fi networks knows it's real easy to cause a lot of interference with Wi-Fi and make devices, especially something as high bandwidth intensive as a camera, uh, not function very well. Mm-hmm. 100%. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a bad deal all around. So um, I will say this is, is gaining more traction. Um, the anti-drone sentiment is gaining more traction, it feels like sometimes. But... Uh, yeah, so just be careful out there, guys, um, and uh, don't don't be that guy that's jamming stuff. Uh, it can cause a lot of chaos above and beyond even just drones. So, but with that, that's all I have tonight. Dave, what you got, bud? Uh, not not much. We are uh, progressing with the work that uh, the new DAC, the uh, Drone Advisory Council, that uh, we're honored to be part of with uh, Aloft and Pilot Institute and. Um, DSPA, Drone Service Provider Alliance, and uh, they're working on uh, a presentation um, to get something a little more sensible around the TFRs around Stadia around the around the country. And uh, the one that uh, Greg, Rev, and you and I are chairing is around um, standard remote ID, the topic that we're having. And so we're proposing and uh, doing a little research uh, to make some recommendations to the FAA and likely to Congress to come up with something a little more practical and um, uh, effective for standard remote ID. So that work is, uh, is happening. And uh, we're also uh, processing a fair number of uh, free these days. And so uh, uh, getting to know the uh, FAA uh, drone zone very well. And uh, so we appreciate that uh, folks are uh, asking us to submit those applications uh, I just remind everyone that everyone everyone here is a volunteer, uh, and uh, w- as quick as we can get a, an application in, it's still there is no service level agreement uh, turnaround from the FAA. So it, it takes usually for me, Alex gets them done quickly. I'm not sure why, but for me, uh, my turnaround in all seriousness has been uh, three to eight months uh, turnaround Jeez. on applications. Could be three, three weeks. Months. Could be three years. Who knows? <clears throat> Right. Ah, the FA just likes me better. That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced. They're just dealing with me now because I know I'll be around longer. <laughs> Dang. That was savage. Harsh. Harsh. <laughs> but true. <laughs> yeah, that's you all never I never know. Had, There's that bus, Alex. <laughs> there is. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh goodness. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh Alex, what you got for us? Anything tonight? Uh GQ Anything? voting is over. I don't think the track's been announced yet, but that'll be released soon. And the GQ season is starting in a couple in about a couple weeks. The GQ season so, of what? The global qualifier for multi GP. <laughs> and the, are those racing. Race- are those races that then will start all over the country simultaneously to, to be brackets? So okay. Chapters will be able to set up the track all across the the country and or, or the world actually, not just the United States. It's a global competition, and so uh, yeah, um, it's a standard track that anyone can set up. It's a ten gates, a hurdle, and five flags. It's um, very cool. And so I don't know which track it is yet, but we'll find that out soon. And uh, we'll see what the season's like. Now, in the time between now, uh, uh, last time and now, did your favorite track change at all? Nope. I also (laughs) didn't try flying a track since. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Fair. So, but I made sure to vote. 
Yeah, what you got for us, bud? Anything? I've got nothing new. Uh, I guess uh, happy now remote ID is being fully enforced days. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, the FAA so. no longer is using their discretion in uh, prosecuting people for <laughs> not using remote ID. I, Did uh, they have discretion to begin with? <laughs> yeah. <that> was... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'll stop. Anyway, I guess we can stop worrying about, uh, you know, the weirdness of the position we in were in in the gray this. period yeah. in the grace period and all that and uh and now now we, things are just the way they said they were going to be which yeah keep moving forward i guess fly in those free navigate the obstacles right that's right <laughs> all right rob anything yeah, so uh, Josh, I guess I'll just continue your trend of negative news. All right. Oh no! <laughs> I'll Dave, finish off gonna and get it right. Dave's um, going to go to bed very sad tonight. <laughs> so, hey, Castellu dropped an article on Drone XL. It's on the front page of that right now. Um, I didn't have time to send it out to y'all. I learned of it this morning. So you're good, man. Uh, so apparently in Utah, uh, some people that filed a grandma request, which is essentially a FOIA request for, I guess. Utah equivalent. And the recent webinar that AUVSI hosted uh, that had Vic and several other big names in the industry, um, they specifically said they did not support, you know, consumer bans and immediate bans of, you know, DJI Autel and things like that. Well, these documents that just got released through this, uh, this grammar process uh, indicate otherwise. And there's explicit support from AUVSI for Part 12 of Senate Bill 135, which is completely contradictory to the public information that they're saying. That's it right there. So it's actually a really good article. Um, if you look, I don't know if, uh, is this the, yeah, Drone XL. So the entire transcript for the AUVSI meeting, I watched the entire meeting, but the entire transcripts in, at the very bottom. And Hay went through and he highlighted all the places where Mike specifically said, we do not support immediate bans. You know, we don't support getting rid of consumer technology. And Again, it's it's looking like there's some conflicting information. So yeah, there's also word that there's a, a few other states that are about to be releasing similar information, but I can't release the names of those states yet. Yeah, we take this one very seriously. And the uh, uh, Haye is uh, a reporter of uh, significant stature. We know him. We respect him. And uh, um, the Mike that uh, Rob mentioned is Mike Robbins, who is the new co-chair of AUVSI. And uh, AUVSI has um, had a record uh, when they go on the record and the, they work either within the AAAC or the DAC before that uh, or uh, on things like uh, Beyond Visual Line of Sight or on uh, Remote ID. Uh, they have never been a supporter of recreational and they're not terribly interested in uh, 107 operations. They are absolutely aligned with uh, AAM. Uh, needs and uh, uh, delivery uh, uh, drone needs. So they uh, we've worked with and uh, 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 sat uh, together working with AUVSI folks in uh, numerous uh, efforts, and they regularly come up on the different on the opposite side of what uh, we're arguing. So this is this is uh, serious, and this is very unfortunate that they would take a public position that is in direct uh, conflict with what they said privately. And officially, and so that's that is uh, uh, we we anticipate that this will uh, reduce the uh, the membership of AUVSI. Also, what's going to be interesting, and I think it's still proceeding, is the FAA has a annual symposium, uh, which is joined at the hip with AUVSI, and so there is no way to get into uh, the uh, this symposium unless you uh, pay around seven hundred, eight hundred dollars entry fee. They did separate. They're, they're, they not separated. Doing, they're not doing co events with the uh, AUVSI. At least they didn't do that last year. Okay. Well, that's a positive. They still mm -hmm. used AV, AUVSI's uh, technology, but they weren't coincided with exponential. That's great. Well, a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I really like uh, the, the top line of that article, uh, too, Josh. If you look there, I really like how he pointed it out. So AUVSI has 7,500 members worldwide. Even if all of those were U.S. members, which they're not, that would only be 2% of the Part 107 certificate holders here. So 
It's a, that, that was a really staggering stat that I thought, I thought that was well done how he inserted that there. So, mm-hmm. all right, well, Hey, we got to finish on something positive, right? So <laughs> uh, last, uh, this uh, last weekend, I had the opportunity to go up to Moore, Oklahoma. Um, the MLDR hosted a first responder series, which was pretty cool. They had, uh, they had law enforcement teams racing against each other with a oh, That's awesome. It was, it was actually with really the, fun to with see. With the yeah, I didn't. Yeah, they wouldn't let them fly anything else, and they wouldn't let them fly them in manual. Uh, but, but that's that's what I mean. The majority of entities use those operationally, so it, it makes mm-hmm. sense. But yeah, lots of that's crashes. Awesome. It was fun to watch. Uh, I didn't actually fly in it. I was there for recruiting efforts. Uh, you know, trying to talk to you know some of these young kiddos that you know are aspiring pilots. Like you know, hey, there's there's a lot of really cool careers in public safety where you can fly drones full time. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just got to watch it. I, I couldn't even tell you who won, but it was it was a lot of fun to watch. So you didn't it, try to recruit the top finishers? No, uh, they did. Were there finishers? So they, they they had two teams of five, and uh, like I said, I don't remember who won. I couldn't tell you because I was I was staffing the booth and I was talking to people and trying to listen and watch at the same time. But oh, uh, it's kind great. of a cool series. They're trying to bring the same thing to the Metroplex here, and uh, we're we're hoping maybe we can do Dallas versus Fort Worth versus Arlington kind of thing. Like get the <laughs> major metropolitan <laughs> players. So it's kind of a it's kind of a fun, unique uh, nonprofit fundraiser kind of scenario. So that's a that's definitely on a on a positive note. Not you mm-hmm. know having some fun and you know flying a uh, racing a Nevada in mm-hmm. what would be uh, uh, angle mode for uh, those of us. <laughs> Yep. So, great. Sounds like a new class for multi GP to have like stock car class, the, the Yamada yeah. racing class. <laughs> we could put little bumpers on them. We could 3D yeah, print kind of what, uh, GPU uh, bumpers on the outside of your Avada. Kind of like. mm-hmm. well, yep, it was uh, it was in a, it was fun to see. It was kind of neat. So, but yeah, that's all I got. I thought that was a good positive way to that's end. That's epic. So. That's awesome. That's great. Very Love positive. It. All right, guys. Uh, I think with that, uh, uh, once more around the room, everybody good? Mm-hmm. Uh, just a quick right. thank you to the yeah. folks on the FPVFC forums that uh, continue to uh, share and offer great uh, support uh, to newcomers as well as technical support. Thank you to, uh, to everyone who's doing that. Uh, I try to get on there and help to the extent I can. Uh, lots of technical support way beyond me, and I, I really appreciate that. Awesome. All right, guys. So with that, we will uh, see you in another two weeks and uh, hopefully we'll have some more. I'll, I'll find some better, more positive news. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's rough out there, man. Well, well, and instead, I, I will, I will throw cycle. out there that the news cycle <laughs> has been very void of anything. Uh, and this time it was full of stuff, but it just wasn't all positive. You know, so. That's it. That's it. I take what I'm I'm given, and uh, you know, that's right. There's only I so many times we have stories of like dangling hot dogs in front of dogs that are stuck, or whatever that story was from a couple of years ago, <laughs> rescuing <laughs> animals with food delivered by by drones, searching for definitely. coyotes. Yeah, you never know. Mm. So. <laughs> Yeah. All right, guys. I uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your week, um, and we'll see you again in another two. So I uh, appreciate you all. Uh, thanks for the, the comments, and, and keep them coming. And we're happy we could be here for you guys. So uh, have a good one. Thank you. Take care. See the end, but we'll see it.